Flight of the Bumblebee by Rimsky Korsakoff, I've told everybody that that song to me exemplifies what I've been through. It's just, I mean, if you can imagine this bumblebee just bouncing all over the place trying to figure out what to do. I'm trying to find the right doctor, the right therapist, the right psychiatrist. The trauma happened back on December 21st of 2011 and that night, there were three people, three guys that came into my home uh, that particular evening, and I was sleeping, and I was held down in my home and repeatedly sexually assaulted. It just was, it was sheer hell for me. It took me a long, long time to really just deal with. I mean, I, I knew these three people that did this to me. <laughs> Two of the people I knew um, were friends and then the other person was um, my partner, my domestic partner, and that was the hardest thing for me to deal with. When I tell this story, people think, well, you know, you work out, you're strong, and there it goes. Like, and immediately when I hit that part, if I get to that part with anybody, um, People will say, well, could you have fought back? And that's the, <laughs> that's the thing. Then it starts coming back to me, like, what should I have been doing? What we're looking for is, are they um, experiencing instability in their relationships? Are they getting in conflict with people? Are they not able to maintain friendships or intimate relationships that they want to maintain? I lost a group of my friends here in Phoenix because they don't understand, and it makes you so mad. With my partner, I shut down for a long time because he and the other two said they weren't involved, so I took ownership for the night. But the problem with that is, over a period of time, that's how the PTSD got so bad for me because I wasn't dealing with the issue. And when I finally started dealing with it, I told people my partner was one of the three. People couldn't believe that. They chose to believe the guy that's smaller, more docile. And then um, the other problem I faced then was when I was struggling with PTSD, these guys wouldn't help me out. My response to what happened to me was anger and I pulled away from everybody. That's what our friends saw is that I was angry with, they didn't want to be around me because I was angry. They didn't want to be around me because I didn't, I wasn't around them. I was around nobody. And I certainly did have friends that would be supportive of me, but the ones that weren't, um, I think it just takes educating. It's just because with like PTSD, you just you can't see. Like if somebody has cancer, you're gonna see that their hair is um, falling out because of chemo, or somebody has a a broken leg, you're gonna see a big cast. A lot of it's actually psychological, it's not just body for me. Um, the physical part, it's just it makes me feel a heck of a lot better. So that's, I've been doing it for, gosh, probably like 30 years now. If somebody goes through sexual abuse or sexual assault, and then they turn to people who they trust, who they believe will help them, who will protect them, who will talk about this with them, and then the person doesn't do that, that's also very confusing. So again, here I am going through this awful experience, and I'm going to turn to my parents or to my teacher or my friends or my coach, someone who I believe will protect me and help me, and then they're met with maybe disregard or doubt or um, maybe it's just kind of ignored. So I have a lot of clients who were sexually abused. They may take it to their parents, for example, and their parents will say, oh, that couldn't have happened. Your uncle would have never done that to you. That's ridiculous. You're just saying this for attention. Or maybe they'll say, oh, okay, that happened, and then never talk about it again. That's a very confusing experience for a person to go through. Because I remember I talked to um, one of our, um, my significant, significant other, our, one of our female friends, and I was talking to her and her husband after I had talked finally about sexual assault happening to me. And I remember talking to them, and I, I told them what happened and told them who was involved. And I just remember she said, well, 
everybody makes mistakes in life and it looks like your partner made made a mistake and you know everybody should be forgiven and I'm thinking rape it's not just a mistake I mean that's I mean, you, you forget, get to get the milk at the grocery store when somebody gives you a list and you come home, you're like, oh shoot, you know, I got the cookies and I got this, but I didn't get, that's a mistake. But being involved in something that almost takes a person's life, that's not just a mistake. And I, and this is one of my friends that's saying this to me. And I mean, when you got friends like that who needs enemies sometimes when you look, but it, I think there's just this sheer ignorance with people that they just, they're not looking at the rape survivor, they're looking more to protect the people that are involved because in their minds they just can't wrap their head around. Um, and that, what I've been finding out from a lot of organizations um, throughout the country is that is pretty common. Well, Ron, uh, when I moved in, he moved in shortly after I did into the building and he had a uh, cleaning service. And I am, you know, at that time I was working like 70 hours a week and I needed someone to kind of help me with this apartment. So he, he and his group would come by once a week and clean. And so I got to know Ron really well that way. And uh, eventually he became one of my patients. So we've known each other probably five or six years now um, as, a, as physician, patient, and as good friends. I guess it was last summer when he kind of began to open up about what was going on with himself. Um, the trauma he'd gone through and a sexual assault um, and by people he trusted, which was kind of, when you kind of get the picture of it, you think it's, it's you know, it's, it's one of those kind of emotional, dramatic things. We think, how in the world could that happen to somebody? Um, and there's not a, a lot of help for someone that goes into the, through those traumas and then is traumatized by it and has the depression, the post-traumatic stress disorder that develops from that. Ron is a real upbeat guy, if you know him. He's just always positive, he's always hardworking, he's always doing well. And he kind of spiraled downward. And um, I tried to recruit him into my business. That wasn't right for him. He went into to a couple of other careers and just, I mean, real hardworking, dedicated, but just not able to, to finish and, and, you know, get to where he needed to be. Ron and I talk a lot about that. Uh, and talk is helpful, but there aren't there aren't any good treatments for that. Uh, I've, in my practice, I've had two or three uh, patients that were involved with the military that went through and still are going through post traumatic, and they you know they're seen at the VA. They've tried medications, but they can't sleep well. They have horrible nightmares. They're preoccupied. It's just kind of bad. If I have trouble sleeping, I'll take uh, Zolpidem, which is Ambien, and then that can help me sleep. I don't really don't want to take anything, but if I'm going to take something, marijuana is a lot better to take. They've shown studies that it can help diminish nightmares, it can help you sleep better. I want to be able to be in control, um, given what's happened to me. And if I'm not, if I'm using marijuana or if I'm using alcohol, then that could actually um, cause a problem for me where I'm not in control. And so I'm a little bit nervous, um, especially these last couple of weeks, to get back to trying the marijuana. I just want to make sure I'm ready for it. Things got really bad again in November of last year and then that's when I finally just thought I'm gonna have to do something because the counseling everything wasn't working that I was doing and so I made the decision that um, I was gonna do something something big and as I was sitting in my studio I just thought what do I like doing I mean and as I sat there I thought well I'm sitting here watching the late show with Stephen Colbert and I thought this is actually something that makes me laugh every day. So I thought this would be my goal. Um, somehow, some way, I would build around that. And then the next day, I was at Staples and saw these giant 30 by 40 inch foam poster boards. And I thought, well, why can't I get a lot of these boards and just go around all over the city and have people sign words of support on there, get behind me? Because one of the things, too, I knew, and a lot of people knew, is that I wasn't getting out. I wasn't engaging with people after the trauma. I would stay in. Um, so that that would afford me the chance to meet people and get out. So the whole idea just came about in early November and I thought I'm going to do this. My name is Blake and I'm trying to get on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert on CBS. 
And I love Colbert, but there's a backstory like why I'm trying to get on a show. I was diagnosed with PTSD and it got real severe over the last year. So everybody in my life just wanted me to get out and meet people again. And because after the trauma, I didn't. And so today is the 113th straight day I meet complete strangers for four hours a day. Um, and this is part of my four hours today. Okay, um, awesome. And then I get people to get behind, they sign words of support on these giant boards of mine getting behind my big ambitious goal, which is to get on his show as a guest. And I want to be able to tell the story of the trauma that I went through, but much more importantly, turn it into something happy, hopeful, and fun. You know, I don't want to be bitter and nasty and angry. I'm trying to move on in my life, and I am moving on. But if I can educate people, like the, the parts that were really hard for me, and say, hey, these are the ways that you can maybe make the road easier for other people that are going to go, because we know people are going to go through the same thing. And that's one of the biggest things too with PTSD. You got to get involved, or especially like with the rape, get involved with that person, trying to help them out. Because um, the road to recovery is a lot smoother when you got people behind you and they got your back. It's important. His goal is to get on a late night talk show. And, uh, you know, who am I to judge someone's, you know, you know, a, a, you know try at helping themselves? Um, and when I look at what Ron's doing, of the, the few people I come in contact with this problem, Ron is the one that has taken it kind of by the horns and said, listen, I'm doing something. I'm, I can't stand living like this. So today I'm here um, in Mesa at the spring training home of the Oakland A's and they um, had invited me. They allowed me to come here and talk to the, some of the players today and um, just tell them the story of what I'm going through with the PTSD and the recovery and what I'm doing to take back my life, trying to get on a late show and just really start a race of that stigma around mental illness. Um, so yeah, they were amazing. They've let me come here and meet um, uh, a lot of the different staff members here for the organization and the players. And so they're signing some of these boards with words of support um, and getting behind my efforts to, to do what I'm doing. Well, I just finished up with the uh, Phoenix Gay Pride Parade. I walked along the parade route for about a mile, met just tons of people today so that they could sign uh, words of support or whatever else they wanted to put on these giant boards of mine to help me get on the Late Show. Today, I mean, everybody's in a really festive mood, so it's been, it was well received today. Um, yeah, it was a, been a pretty amazing day so far. It's become so like fun for me to just get people's stories that they put on these boards and it's like a collection of um, just the variety of people you meet and then they share with you whether it's I mean now I've had people sign in 68 languages um, they, they get a choice of 24 colors to put on here um, but yeah I certainly and it get, gets people excited to see that my goals get on the lead show so people get excited behind me and they want to see me on there hey guys can you believe over the last 84 days I have met over 5,500 new people that have signed my giant petition boards to help me get on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. Awesome. Um, for mic check, let's get you to say and spell your name. Um, Ron Blake, R-O-N-B-L-A-K-E. Right. You just randomly encounter someone, what do you say to them to get them to sign the board? It depends. I mean, I'll, I'll feel them out. I mean, some people, um, in some cases, I guess I, I, I have to sense something and feel it, so I might, might go in depth. And it depends too on what they're sharing with me or talking about. A local man suffered a trauma so horrific, it nearly drove him to kill himself. But instead, he came up with his own way to battle PTSD. I spent some time with Ron Blake, who shared with me his plan that involves Stephen Colbert, The Late Show, and a huge personal goal. I think that Ron Blake's approach to treating his PTSD, while it's certainly unique and doesn't really follow the um, evidence-based approach to the treatment of PTSD, it sounds like he's feeling better. And at the end of the day, isn't that what we're all searching for and hoping for with our clients? This one says, Blake, I know what PTSD is like. Thank you for being such a positive example of strength and showing others that recovery is possible. These boards have so much character. There's 
babies have spit up. <laughs> I had, had blood on them. Uh, people have spilled coffee. A dog jumped all over one of them with muddy paws. Look at those Vikings fans. That's a throwback. That was like in the first month that I did this project. I went to the Arizona Cardinals game and that was pre-game. I'd like to see what those guys look like post-game. <laughs> My first impression was that he was super friendly, like he was the first neighbor to introduce himself to me and to say like, if you ever need anything, let me know, if you ever need me to take care of your dog or anything like that, like he was here. So yeah, he was very cool. I was really interested in like the project that he was thinking about doing and he had actually kind of had that spark like right when I first moved in. So I got to see like the thoughts that he was having about doing it. Um, and my excitement about that kind of like started our relationship as friends. Yeah, I'm looking at buying new shirts and shorts because I got markers, Sharpie, I got Sharpie markers all over my clothes lately. I'm like some like little schoolboy that like, ruined my clothes. So that's why I'm like looking at stuff today. <laughs> These shorts are actually okay, but I got marker on like all the sides of these shirts. These are cool, but I think I have to destroy these within a week or two. Get them so dirty. So I met Ron Blake during winter break. I was working in the Baird office and we were all kind of like, why is this man here? And he started telling us his story and if we were willing to sign his board like as a form of like petition to get on the late show. So we heard his story and he was telling us how he was a PTSD survivor. So I was like, yeah, I'll sign your, your board, of course. So um, a couple days later, I kept just seeing him just walking around downtown Phoenix and like especially in the campus. And it wasn't until I saw him the second time when he actually explained to me like what happened. And I was like, oh my god, like, that's not what I thought PTSD was like, was. I thought it was like, oh, I went to war in Iraq and I came back and I have PTSD. And so when I heard his story, I was like, oh my god, like, I was so shocked. I didn't know that PTSD can just take so many forms and post-traumatic stress disorder can mean, can apply to any, like, situation that's traumatic. I think what's inspiring about his story is that he is taking a very difficult experience, something that could really destroy a person's life, and he's making meaning out of it, and he's turning it into something that's um, you know, a life-changing experience for him. He's taking positives out of this, but he's also, it sounds like, really engaging in his community and maybe helping others by telling his story. I know I've come in like to his life at sort of a strange time, just because this project is like, so um, just enveloping like his everyday life. He's one of the most like vibrant people that I've ever met in my whole life. And he's just really, really like passionate about people and about connecting with people. Um, he's really funny and he's like always trying to find humor and just everyday things. Um, and he just has a great personality. Like he's very, He's like one of those people who's magnetic, like people are just sort of drawn to him and he doesn't really have to try hard to connect with people, so, yeah. Each day that I do this, um, it seems like somebody's gonna come to me and they're gonna pray with me or they're gonna say, hey, you know, could, do you mind if I pray with you? And sure, I mean, I'm not gonna turn anything down. I think even if you were an atheist, why would you turn somebody down? I mean, if somebody's offering you something kind, um, to me that, yeah, it's really nice to know that people do stuff like that. Um, so it's always going to be a part of who I am and each day I go out I mean I meet just incredible people that I mean they don't have to pray for me but sometimes they're just nice and they'll shake my hand or they'll hug me um, and, and to some degree that's maybe their faith whatever they believe in is, is, is coming to me and I like that. Someone I know I don't know him personally but I work with his wife and he's a veteran uh, from Iraq. A handsome young man in good, great shape. They've got two of the most beautiful little kids. And he's got post-traumatic stress, or he had. He committed suicide about 10 days ago. And it just, you know, I don't even know the guy. <clears throat> 
but I recognize the pain. Uh, and I look at Ron and think, God, he's so close to doing that at times. And uh, this kid just was by himself. I wish I could have gotten Ron together with this kid, because I think it may have helped the kid get through one bad night. Because that's what it was. It's, it's a bad night, and you make a permanent decision on a temporary problem. And, you know, that's where Ron, I just, <clears throat> I, uh, I really look forward to watching his progress. I look forward to being able to refer people to Ron and saying, listen, I've got a friend that's going through what you're going through and he's done well with it. He's, 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 he's got control back in his life. Um, he's got a sense of purpose in his life. And I think that might something you would need. So, I mean, it, Ron, watching Ron develop that and basically on his own, you know, he's not going to classes to learn psychology and counseling or any of that kind of stuff. He's just doing this by hard knocks. And that's what, you know, I look as a doctor, I'm always looking for someone that I can use in my reference panel to, to, to get people in for help. And Ron's that kind of person. This whole journey for me has been more than just getting on The Late Show. This journey has been saving my life because five months ago, Every day I would sit and think about killing myself, every single day, and I don't think that way right now. And and even when I don't have these gigantic boards with me every day, the tendency is to go toward people, and that wouldn't have happened before. It's changing my mind, and that's helping me. And we do live in this social media world, which is unbelievable believable to me because I go up to strangers every day and a lot of them and they actually like it and I like it too and I mean sometimes there's no medicine that we can have in life that's going to take care of our problems but we have each other you guys and we can help each other and that's amazing And that's one of the scary things about PTSD, is that it can be so isolating. You can feel so alone. You can feel like nobody understands what you're going through. But the moment you take that risk to be vulnerable, to ask for help, and receive that support from other people, that's the moment your journey changes. Now I've met, in the last 147 days that I've done this project, I've met almost 9,000 people now and it's been incredible. Like, people have been my energy, my power. I was sexually assaulted when I was 16 years old, and I'm not really afraid to, like, tell my story. And that's one of the things that he's really, like, influenced me on, like, as a survivor of sexual assault. It's not, um, oh, pity me, this is my woe story. Like, I want people to make me feel better about myself, and that's not our intention by sharing our story. We want to be able to give a voice to people who don't have a voice and show them that these things happen, that it's normal, and that especially men feel like it's taking something from them, like their masculinity, like they can't, they can't, men can't be raped, people say, but like it happens to everyone, and by like Men, women sharing their stories, it just shows how this is a human component. This is like something that happens to humans, not just women or gay men. It happens to everyone. And so that was really impactful. And he's just made me more like positive about the world. Like shit happens and we can take our lives into a direction where we can make it better. Some people are starting out, it's getting more and more like, you know, it's been a good ride. You've, you've helped a lot of people, you've helped yourself. Maybe it's time to just wrap it up. And I get that more and more. I'm like, why do Who you... Who says that? You'd be surprised. Like, like more, friends or like people that you're meeting? People I'm meeting and even some friends because I think that's just indicative of the society we live in. Like, it's like we want in, in instant gratification. As time has gone on, um, <laughs> I don't think people imagine I would go past like this level I'm at, like this many mm -hmm. days, but it doesn't, some people tell me like, you know, it doesn't just happen sometimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, can I tell anybody it's gonna happen? I, I mean, I don't know. 
but I'm gonna keep going as it makes me happy and it's making other people happy. And those people have learned one big thing about me. I'm more than PTSD. I'm actually thinking about going to different parts of the country this summer and just meeting people. Could be a really fun journey just to get in the car and go. Thank you.